Hey everyone, welcome to San Francisco or Autism Society San Francisco Bay Area's first webinar of the year. I'm Jill Escher, I'm one of your hosts today and we're very happy uh, to be talking insurance. Um, all of you attendees, you are on mute so you can be as loud as you want, no problem, we won't hear you. Um, when we get to the live Q&A or even beforehand, please submit your questions to our guest via the question bar. If for some reason you can't do that because you're on the phone or something else, you can also um, email us questions for her at info at sfautismsociety.org, and we will get to those toward the end. Um, this session is being recorded and it will be archived on our website. You will also be emailed a link. So if you have to leave early or you have to go out and get coffee or whatever, don't worry about it. Um, you'll be able to hear the recording later. One, one. There we go. Our guest today is Karen Fessel, who is the Executive Director of the Mental Health and Autism Insurance Project. Um, our format today is really, as you, as you probably already know, it's an open Q&A. It's not one of your standard webinars with lots of slides where we go step by step to give you an overview of a subject. If you want to learn more about insurance and autism, generally, you should check out their website, mhautism.org. Your moderators today are myself and Feda Almalidi, um, who is Vice President of SFASA. Introducing Karen. Karen um, is both the founder and the executive director of MHAIP. She founded um, the Autism Health Insurance Project after struggling to secure services for her own son who has Asperger's. She started it to help children on the autism spectrum obtain medically necessary services by supporting families in their journey through the insurance maze. And I think we can all agree that it definitely is a maze. I've been stuck in that maze for years. Karen holds a doctorate in public health from UC Berkeley, and she is the proud parent of a 24-year-old son with Asperger's and a 20-year-old daughter. Again, just a reminder, if you have questions, we are not telepathic. You have to type them into the control panel under the questions bar. And uh, because we wanna get through as many questions as we possibly can within this hour, maybe a little bit more than an hour, we're gonna try to stick to the two minute per question rule. There will of course be exceptions. So if you hear Feta or me nudging Karen, it isn't because we're mean to Karen, it's because we're just simply trying to squeeze in as much information as we can. And if we go over by quite a bit, we can always schedule another one of these. So let's not panic too much about it. All right, so what we're gonna do is I'm gonna turn this over to Feta, and she has about eight questions that were submitted ahead of time. We're gonna start with those questions. When we're done with those, we are going to, um, read through the, the questions that you guys are submitting live. Okay, Feda, can you take it over? Okay, so our first question is, and you just want me to read these, Jill, right? Okay, great. So our first question is, can you keep your disabled, conserved child on your family's health insurance after he, she turns 26? So what, Karen, go ahead. Uh, yeah, you can, and you need to call like the member services side of the plan, and um, and explain the situation and ask what they what documentation they need to see in order to do that. Most plans allow you to do that, especially if it's a family plan. Karen, I'm just curious: is there a particular state law that governs what discretion the plans have um, in this arena? I don't. I don't know of anything that says that they can't. I mean, ultimately, parents get older and they go to Medicare and then it becomes a little bit different. But this one is specifically health, health, private health insurance. And my understanding is that most plans allow this. Now, occasionally there might be a plan that doesn't and it's more of like an exception thing. Um, and so people may run into trouble. But for the most part, most people report that they haven't had trouble with that. That's what I've heard. Okay, for an adult who has SSI linked Medi-Cal, who's in a managed care plan, as the only insurance, 
What are the range of assessments and therapeutic services that can be covered? Um, well, there's not a lot, um, there's not as much available for adults as children. Um, I do believe they can get assess assessed um, if they need an assessment. Um, and um, like, so a mental health assessment, it, they might have to go to county mental health. Um, and um, uh, like speech and occupational therapy, um, that those might, they should be covered. Um, but how much they're gonna be covered, I don't know. And, and in terms of getting ABA for adults, that's kind of another issue. And we're not really there yet, sadly. Um, and can you explain the difference of how, for example, mild to moderate is in plan and moderate to severe is in county mental health, why that is? Um, well, I would say that autism as in general is handled within um, the, the main medical plan. Um, and then uh, the other other mental health issues are carved out to the county and people we've had complaints that the counties are not necessarily that adept at managing um, developmental disabilities. Okay. This so, might go a little longer. And can you talk about like, how does one establish medical necessity? What is the basis for medical necessity and why things need to be medical necessity? Obtaining treatments, obtaining treatments, like b before you get treatments, treatment has to be medical necessity and why that it is has to be, it has to be um covered and and so that's going to be the biggest um factor um and so it depends what the treatment is that's going to guide how medical necessity is managed if the person that wrote that has more specific uh questions they can they can write it in but um it really depends on what treatments but the treatments have to be covered treatments for adults and it has to be based on evidence-based well, for the most part, yes. Okay. Thanks, Karen. Evidence-based treatments. Yes. Thank you, Sveta. <laughs> uh, Karen, just a little follow-up. You said we're not quite there yet when it comes to adults and ABA. What That's is the age cutoff? Medicaid. What, under the, under the current law. 21, I believe. Yeah, 21. For so Medicaid, yes. after 21, um, uh, in terms of ABA, parents should go to their regional centers and they continue to provide services. The Lanterman Act is from cradle to grave. So, okay. Is that also true for private insurance? Uh, no, um, no. And in California specifically, there's no age limit to, um, to ABA. So, um, there's no official age limit. Now, some of the plans, they might try to argue that there's no, um, medical evidence and yes. we, we encourage um, uh, ABA providers to try to publish as much as they can on um, for adults and teens because we sometimes do get hit with that and then we have to make an argument for medical necessity. So the more publications that we have that support that, that are well done, the stronger you know we can fight back against that and even influence Medi-Cal eventually and Medicaid. Okay, does, um may HIP have experience with um, coverage issues and service or prescription drug approvals for adults who are Medicare or Medi Medi? If so, what are some whoops, common difficulties or avenues to address um, them effectively? Um, we and does will, make, you know, work on such cases? Have you worked on any of these cases? Yeah, we've done a little bit. Also, wait, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, Karen, sorry. If you can explain, I don't know every if everyone knows what Medi Medi means. If you can explain that first and then answer the question. Okay. okay yes. So Medi-Cal is um, is the program for both uh, people below a certain income threshold, and then also it's the program for those with um, with um, disabilities that qualify for disability uh, for SSI um, and Medicare is the program for seniors, but also for people who have um, either worked and become disabled or um, for a young, uh, for a, 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 a person with a lifelong disability, um, if their parents become, at the point their parents become eligible for uh, Medicare, they, they often can as well. 
um, under their parents' program. And so there are people that have both med, both medis. And we don't do a lot with Medicare, I've got to say. And I do refer families to HICAP in California, H-I-C-A-P. Um, it might be .com, and it's a great organization. I love it. They have they train seniors to field most of the phone calls, and they answer all the questions. And they're they're really knowledgeable, and they, I think they have a great training program. So, um, for more specific information on Medicare, I do recommend um, folks call um, HICAP. Um, and um, so so there's very specific formularies. Um, uh, and what I would, if you have a real need to, like if you've been through a whole bunch of medications and they have not been successful, then the best thing you can do is have your doctor write that up. And then when you get a denial letter saying that, um, well, if they try to tell you at the pharmacy that a given medication is not in the formulary, ask for a specific denial letter. Tell them that you're gonna need a denial letter for that. And if you can't get it, then call the health plan and ask them and tell them that you tried to get it and you couldn't and ask for a denial letter. And then you can appeal and you wanna get your doctor to write up all the medications that you've tried in a given category and you know why they were not appropriate or successful and that you need something off the formulary. So, um, so often it's like, we don't really, we don't do a lot of that directly, but we advise people on what to do for that. And, um, I've won them for myself. I have like, I'm a chronic bad sleeper and I've tried a lot of different sleep meds. And, um, and then for some reason, Ambien went off the list. And so I had, um, uh, my regular doctor, not even, not a psychiatrist or anything. She just wrote a letter and we got it covered again. So. And just to be clear for the audience, and I know Jill has some legal background, if it's not in writing, it didn't happen. Right. So everything so has to be in writing. Actually, my, my doctor called the plan well, and she explained yeah. it. But she, you know, I don't know. I don't know how she did that. And then all of a sudden I got this approval letter. So that was nice. But don't bank on a Medi-Cal doctor no. calling the plan. <laughs> um, well, maybe she wrote. I don't know what she did, but she did something to take care of it. So. Okay. Okay. Um, my granddaughter is 20 and she's on Medicaid. So I just want to explain that it's Medicaid in the rest of the United States, but in California, because we like to be special, we call it Medi-Cal. Okay. So when she says Medicaid, she actually means Medi-Cal. Um, so my granddaughter's 20 and she's on Medicaid now through Blue Shield. And fortunately, we have never been able to find a decent doctor who accepts her plan. My insurance man told me the reason is in California, the percentage of doctors who accept Medicaid is 6%. Mm -hmm. Is it possible to receive Medi-Cal and Medicaid, uh, Medi -Medi, <laughs> Medi-Cal and Medicaid? I know when she started having seizures, we were looking for a neurologist. No one accepted Medicaid, but some accepted Medi-Cal. Her regional center case manager is not helpful with this situation. I need for information on how do you apply for Medi-Cal? Well, I'm very confused here because I don't know if you mean Medicare and Medi-Cal. If Medicare. grandmother is the primary, you know, if the parent or, you know, if the grandmother is the, is, is um, acting as the parent um, and she's on Medicare, then, um, then we probably are talking about Medicare. Medicare. Yeah. Um, and so it sounds like they have, she has Medicaid or Medi-Cal through, um, uh, through regional center perhaps, I'm not yeah, sure. Yes. And then, um, and then, so she wants to use a medic, a, a neurologist through Medicare. If that's the correct situation and I'm not positive it is, um, then um, you need to get her, um, I think you're going to need to show guardianship um, and contact Medicare and explain that she needs to go through, um, she needs to, you need to cover her because she's your dependent, if that is in fact the case. And if she has, if her parents are still working, then Medicare probably is not an option for her if they're not yet 65. So I don't know if that answered it, but I think you need to um, reach out to Medicare, the uh, the membership and enrollment piece of Medicare, and explain the situation if you are her guardian. 
if she is your responsibility. And they may ask for financial information like a tax return showing that she's your dependent or if she's conserved, they may ask for conservator documents. Um, Karen, quick quick question. I think this might be a, maybe a little bit too basic for people, but if you're new to the system, you're in the regional center, and you just want to get your kid on Medi-Cal, mm -hmm. can you just quickly summarize what people have to do to just get sign up? I kids? believe they have to nag their caseworkers, and I my son, in, interestingly enough, we weren't using enough regional center services when he was um, under 18. And so we ended up getting him qualified for um, SSI, and then that's how we got uh, Medi-Cal. So I think Theta is better in a better situation to answer this question. Yeah, so there's um, a different type of Medi-Cal through the regional center. It's called institutional deeming Medi-Cal, and you get that regardless of your parents' income. And what it is is that you have to, it's based on the severity of your child's disability, you have to meet some kind of formula, um, and you have to have at least two services that apply to it. it right. could, one could be respite, just, but you have to be utilizing at least two services. Um, I mean, you can have it when you're three, just as soon as you qualify for status two. But the good thing is it's not based on the parent's income. And the whole reason, reason, excuse me, that it's called institutional deeming is, which it's a special, it's a special waiver program. It's because a long time ago, people used to give their kids up to the institution. And basically the state created this waiver and said, hey, you know what, we're going to give you this additional help, no matter what your income is, just take care of your kids at home. Don't give them to us. So, that, I mean, that's truly what it is. <laughs> yes, that's very good, Feta. Thank you for that. Okay, moving on. Okay, this is three questions. At what age does a young adult not qualify for ABA under a parent's insurance plan? Let's go ahead and take that first. Um, okay, so if the parent has private insurance, then, um, and the child, uh, so once the child uh, there's no age limit on ABA. And so once the um, child turns 26, depending on their the level of like dependence that they are on the parent, then the, the parent may continue to be able to get them covered under their plan and they would continue to be able to get um, ABA under the private insurance plan if, that, if they meant private insurance. So there's no age restriction on ABA. Yeah. Um, the other thing is when they um, they the parent could or somebody could buy the child a private policy, and that's another option for like when the um, parent um, retires and goes on Medicare because Medicare doesn't currently cover ABA either. Yeah, and we recommend a lot of people do that. Number if two, they if they can afford it, yes. Can a young adult with autism, 19 or over, qualify for Medi-Cal EPSDT, which is Early Periodic Screening, Diagnosis, and Treatment Services? 19 and over. Uh, yeah, up to 21 in California. Yeah. Um, so uh, in some states it is 19. That That is correct. Um, I want to say something else, which is um, to question one. I want to say that there are people with autism that need ABA that hold their own jobs and that um, they would um, continue to, they might qualify for private insurance and they sure. would be able to get um, ABA through private insurance. Um, now, as long as it's state regulated, there's state regulated plans and there are self-funded plans. And there are some self-funded plans that do put age limits on ABA. Um, they There have been lawsuits and they have um, like given up, you know, they often will give up when they get, if they get sued. Um, but there are some that had to go all the way to court. Anyway. Okay. Um, what services can a person with autism receive under Medi-Cal EPSDT? They other get, than screening, diagnostic, and treatment services. Well, that's what they get. Screening, yeah. diagnostic, and treatment services. And well, so well maybe the type of treatment autism services. Autism services, they can get ABA, speech, OT, PT. Um, what else? Um, 
you know, in theory, they they may be able to get other services. There's kind of there's a list, but they're supposed to be get able to get anything that's medically necessary that um, is like evidence based medically necessary that um, that remediates the symptoms of their autism. And so, like okay. parent training and wraparound oh, yeah. services. So that's and also and wraparound services. So yes. and and residential treatment and um uh, hospital care and, and all that, you know, if it's needed. Yes. Yeah. It, it, it's based on need and it's, it's a, it's a very powerful law and it's stronger than regular insurance and regular Medicare. Very robust. Yeah. Because the point is they want to, um, treat the disability because they know that, that investing in children saves money down the road when they become adults they don't need as many services if they've been treated um when they were children and that's okay, the yeah. philosophy. We're it's been around since the 60s okay we're gonna move on get all these things through it okay my daughter is qualified via sark san andreas regional center for medi-cal it's a free service but none of her providers speech ot aba accept it as a secondary insurance how do we use it so basically they will um, use that institutional yeah. deeming medical to pay for the co-pays oh that's how you use it yeah oh uh, wait a minute yes legally yes but okay here's the hook so you're not supposed to take money from the providers are not supposed to take money including co-payments from people that um also have medical however there is no way they can force that if the person is not in network with medical so that's kind of the hook um so they're not supposed to be taking your money according to federal law it's a federal program and state law however um it's hard to require that if they don't um take if they if they don't work with the medical system and i i will say something that people have encountered where it's been helpful is that if their child needs to be hospitalized um most hospitals do take medical actually not all of them but a lot of them do and so it's been useful there um it's been useful with um uh, medication, if the medication is in the formulary, if it's not in the formulary, you can try to get an exception to it because most pharmacies also take medica medical. Um, and then um, durable medical equipment. Yeah, equipment. Yeah, they it can be funded at like it's, it's supposed to be funded at 100 percent. So, yes, thank you. Yeah, augmented communication devices. Those things can be like eight thousand dollars. That's funded by medical. Dedicated, yeah, not an iPad. Yeah. Right. Okay. Next, we can go to the next one. Okay. I have Anthem Blue Cross, but the network ABA providers have lengthy waiting lists. Can I go out of network? What should I do? My son is three and has severe autism. These are my so favorite yes, questions. You can go out of network if you have a provider that has availability. However, you need to um you need to do everything that you can to make it very clear that um you tried to find someone in the network so go through the list and document it and then you need to call before you start services with your out of network person you want to call the insurance company back the health plan and say hey i called everybody nobody can see my son i did find someone who can see my son i would like to see dr so and so or this agency because they can take him now and everybody else they they wouldn't even they're not supposed to put you on a wait list they wouldn't even you know they can't serve my client and if you get pushback from your um your health plan about that then you can um if it's if it's a fully funded also known as state regulated plan in california you can take it to either whichever regulator regulates your plan and tell them you want an expedited uh review of this situation and um they should be able to help you and if they don't please call me okay and um i don't know if you have my office my office number is in the um uh, on my website. Actually, I'll give it out right now. Office number 925-388-0892. And if you can't get your son in and they don't have a person and you do have a person, yes, uh, we can help if DMHC is or CDI is not helping you follow up with that promptly. 
so I, I, uh, that is just, can you go back to that slide for one moment, Jill? I have another, th that way is completely works 100%. I have also been successful in calling up the plan and saying, hey, I have called this provider, this yeah. provider, this provider. They all have wait lists. I want you, you to come back with me, give me the name of three providers that have immediate availability right now to take my child. And then maybe will come in and then you'll call them. No, yeah. no, no. They will have to, they will come up with a list oh. of provider that has immediate availability. And if they can't, then you'll say, I have this provider and I need you to right. contract with them. So you don't have to go through the grievance process. So make them do the work for you. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And they, I have had a lot of yeah. success with that. Don't okay. go running around. Okay. And Thank you. So that's another way of doing it. Okay, here's um, the last one before we go to the audience. Okay, from an ABA agency, this is from an ABA agency. When discharging a client, what are the most important steps to ensure legality? Um, okay, so it depends on why they're discharging the client. If they're discharging the client because the client has graduated and everybody agrees that they don't need it anymore then that's that they can just discharge the client if they feel that the, the client doesn't need it anymore but the parent does feel that they need it i think they need to try to get on the same page and figure out what's going on um if there are other issues going on and you know you're not getting along or you're having trouble working with their insurance i think it's best to do like a warm handoff um, and I think there are ethical issues involved, such as like to just drop them and they don't have a place to go and you know that they're not going to, it's going to take several months to get services, which does sometimes happen. And so um, if you know, if you, if you strongly suspect that's going to happen and if there's no one to take the client, I mean, in my opinion, it's best to hang on to them until you've at least um, helped the family line up another provider. I mean, and I do believe the BACB, the board of the Behavior Analyst Certification Board, they have a long list of ethics around this issue. And I would encourage you to read their policy on this kind of thing. And if they don't, let me know, but I'm pretty sure they do. And I think that it's important to not abandon the clients and make sure that they have something lined up. Um, and that's it, it might so you might have to stay with that client longer than you'd like even when you're having trouble with their agency um and you may not like hearing that um so that's my understanding yeah there needs to be an appropriate transition plan even if you're discharging them you need to titrate down the services too it can't just go from 20 hours to zero over a week you know so thank you that's you're right about that too because our kids don't handle transitions well and it needs to be accounted for okay beta um we have a lot of questions that have been oh. submitted already so why don't you go ahead and um okay. yeah go ahead i i can't see them over i can't see them either oh you can't nope. Nope. okay well we're having a little technical difficulty here I'm sorry about that. That's my bad. I'm going to have to go ahead and, and say the questions then. I'm so sorry. Yeah. All right. Uh, my son, who is high functioning autistic, was denied any ABA services, though he has acute emotional behavior and has assaulted me multiple times. He is 12. He can't even get therapy services in the plan. Um, so I'm, I'm trying to figure out exactly what the question is here. What plan is this? Can she write in? Hmm? Can she write in what plan is this and is it a state regulated plan or is it a self-funded plan that does not have the benefits? Yeah, and I'm not sure. Maybe. Okay, so if you're still out there, whoever wrote that, we need more clarification to answer your question. And then. Um, uh, Assuming how about this? Let's assume it's a state regulated plan. Let's assume, let's assume it's a, even if it's an HMO or PPO and it's state regulated. Right. Well, we need to see. You need to get a denial in writing, and you need to see why they have denied um, coverage for your child. Um, so that's one thing that you need to do. And if it's a um, if you have Medi-Cal, 
um, through regional center. If your child is severe, you should, and you're in California, hopefully you do have regional center. And then you can, um, you can take that denial to regional center and they will try to prov get you in somewhere for um, uh, ABA services if that's what your child needs or they will try to figure out, you know, help you get services through um, Medi-Cal. So if that person can write back, have you heard from that person, Jill? Can you scroll um, down? Yeah, more? here, she wrote back. Okay. Uh, before it was a self-funded plan, now it is under United Healthcare. Mm, well, it's, it's, it could still be self-funded. You yeah, should get a copy said, of- She adds that regional center denied services. Really? Um, that doesn't make sense. If he's that doesn't mean that he's a regional center client. Maybe they just denied him. Wait, is he a regional center client or does he not qualify for regional center? Well, we don't know. Um, okay, just let's just go to the next life. question until we get more info. Yeah. Okay. All right. My adult son has just recently qualified for SSI benefits and Medi-Cal. It mm -hmm. is retroactive to August 2018. Meanwhile, I've been paying into COBRA, a UHC PPO plan through my previous employer. Medi-Cal sent a note this week that my medical benefits are also retroactive to August. This is long, sorry. My previous employer not notified me that when my son gets Medi-Cal, that mm -hmm. I am required to cancel the COBRA for him. Mm -hmm. So claims made to UHC should still be covered through March since I paid for COBRA, or will they try to refund my money and have any claims redacted? This is a little bit too long of it. Um, I don't think they can rescind after the fact. It's called rescission, yeah. and, and they kind of make a big deal about it. Um, so I think that going forward, and I'm, I haven't heard that either. They can kick someone off because they have Medi-Cal, even in COBRA. I haven't heard that um, if you have Medi-Cal as secondary and you have COBRA as primary, I think that's still primary. So I would want to see the written paperwork on that um, or show it to an attorney. Because to me, I don't, I am not aware that you can do that. And I, I'm pretty sure you can't kick them off after the, like in, in retrospect, like retrospectively kick them off. Because what are you supposed to do? Go back and sub every, all your treatments that you got in for nine months. What what are you supposed to do with them? You think Medi-Cal is going to pay? They're not you know? retroactively kicking her off. They're just saying she can't have it going anymore. forward. All right. I thought she said the opposite. No, okay. no, 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 no. I haven't heard of that. And I would read the fine print and I would ask for clarification on where it says that in the plan manual or in the COBRA doc documentation. Okay. All right, let's move on. Here's another one about adults. Adults are definitely a big theme on our um, mm -hmm. webinar. Right. I don't, I don't blame for, them. for continuing an adult child on private health insurance after age 26, my understanding is that at least some insurers define dependent as being an IRS declared dependent, which may affect adult child's eligibility for housing vouchers, et cetera. Comment? I don't know about that one. I don't know about that either. I haven't heard that. And I haven't heard of people having problems. It doesn't surprise me that if it does, and if you can reach out to me, you know, separately, send me an email, Karen at mhautism.org. I, I would like to learn more about that if that's in fact happening. Um, if you have conserved this uh, adult child, um, I think that's going to go a long way. And um, I'm not sure what else. If the adult child is earning their own income, as in has a paying job, as opposed to DDS um, income only, then it may be an issue. But if they are not working in their getting public funds only, then I don't think it is an issue. But I am open to hearing more about this. So you can educate me. Okay. Um, here's one. If we use a doctor not with Medi-Cal who prescribes medication, will Medi-Cal cover it? What about off-label use of a prescription? Um, all right. If it's in Medi-Cal's formulary, I do believe they should cover it. Um, and um, the second question was what? 
Uh, what about off-label use of the prescription? Well, if it's if we're talking about psych meds, um, that usually is not a problem um, mm -hmm. because uh, so many people with autism have many psychological, um, other psychological uh, symptoms as well that need treatment. So um, I'm not sure exactly what you mean by off-label. For the most part, I, I don't think it's a problem. Um, but if it is, I would have the doctor write something to justify it medically. Like some kids might use blood pressure medication. Oh, clonidine you know, for um, sleep. For example, to treat, you know, yeah, their aggressive behavior. Or, so it's really, right. that would be off-label. <laughs> Usage. Yeah, yeah, but that's like common. Or, or Topamax, for example. What? All right. Or Topamax is another one that's highly yeah. used it's a lot. Yeah, seizure med. Yeah. Um, yeah. I I would have the doctor write something up if you're having trouble with it. Um, but if it's not in the formulary, yeah, it's going to be you're going to have to show that you've tried the the ones that are in the formulary and they weren't successful. So yeah, that that can be a problem with medical and with right. any. Here's a question I, I hear quite a bit. Uh, my son is under our private insurance and he also has Medi-Cal. There's a huge deductible and only 50% coverage for his speech therapy. How can we get Medi-Cal to cover the deductible and co-insurance? Okay, well, if you're under a certain income threshold and I think it's 400% um, of the federal poverty level, region, and, and your son has regional center, so that's a lot of ands. Yeah, and she um, says they're in Sark. Oh, okay. Then yeah, they they are supposed to pick up. Um, if you're under, it's about a hundred thousand a year for a family of four, something like that. You can Google federal poverty level, and it's four hundred percent. So if the family income is under that, then um, they're supposed to uh, pick up those um, out of pockets. My understanding, at least the deductibles. Um, and if you're above that, um, you can. There, if this is, is this an adult. Does it not say? Um, it doesn't say. Okay, I so know. if it's a child, there's like United Children, United Healthcare Children's Fund. There are certain charities. We, at one point, we've listed them on our website, and I don't know if they're still there. Um, uh, there are a number of charities you can apply for um, to get <coughs> some payment back. Um, it, but also, again, uh, it's most likely to be effective if you're under a certain income threshold. So um, if you're above a certain income threshold, then you kind of got to look when it's time to choose your plan and figure that if you've got a high deductible, um, you're going to be uh, spending that. Sorry. Okay. Yep. All right. Moving on. If parents allow the school district to bill Medi-Cal, does that mm -hmm. create any risks for future liens? Any other downsides? Do you recommend allowing this? Um, it depends what's going on. If um, sometimes I don't, um, just because I don't want the health plan to know, like if they're getting speech and OT in the school and you're trying to get Medi-Cal to cover speech and OT, like in a clinical setting, then you could get it. It could be problematic. There is a law called FERPA. Oh gosh, what is it? It's a it's a it's a law that provides confidentiality um, of the IEP, and so technically you don't have to do that, and they're not supposed to share it if you don't check the box. So in the past, I have told parents not to check the box, and then when there's um, been um, special educators in the audience, they like gasp and they don't like that very much. <laughs> But I'm trying to look out for the best interests of the families. So, um, and I have um, heard of problems with that, um, where we had some clients that were trying to get clinical speech therapy, and they had it in school, and and they were trying to argue that we're already paying for it. So, yeah. I mean, what it basically the thing is is that one is educationally necessary appropriate yeah. and what is medically necessary but then you know they don't know the difference and it's hard to argue it with yeah, medical I would just say don't check rather be safe than sorry don't check the box and make yeah. sure the box is checked when you get there already anyways right that they haven't checked it for you um thank you um 
I have an 11 year old child who receives ABA services funded through private insurance and Medi-Cal. We have oh. been with the same ABA provider for several years. The provider has told us they want to terminate him as a client with little notice due to staffing issues and quote, lack of progress. The provider is not giving us all the hours authorized now. Do you have referrals for autism insurance attorneys we can consult with? Well, um, I would say you need to look at what's going on and can you find another provider? Because, I, I mean, I think Feta has her own opinion about this, but it sounds like things are not working well right now and it worked for a while, but I think you need a new ABA provider and um, you should try to find one as soon as possible. Um, that's my opinion. Um, you want to address that, Feta? Yes, I do. Okay. okay good. <laughs> so this is the thing. Like, you might be authorized 25 hours of services, and they're only providing 15 hours of services. So in actuality, your child is not getting the amount of services they need. Okay? Yeah. So it's good so, reason they're not making progress. Yeah there's a, probably a good reason he's not making progress and you know things change the law says to restore maintain or improve functioning to the maximum extent practicable that's the type of services you're supposed to receive and maybe the goals are too hard you know what i mean they need to work on adjusting those goals also this is the thing they want to if they want to cut services before anybody cuts services, let's say you're taking antibiotics. Let's look at it this way. It's because services, autism services are on parity with medical services. You took an antibiotic and it didn't work. We don't just say, oh, the antibiotic didn't work. We're not going to give you anything else. We're going to give you a stronger or a higher dose of antibiotic. And that's really how we look at ABA treatment or any kind of thing like that before we say, oh, it's not working. So I would say this ABA, you know, company, sorry, sucks. Okay. <laughs> I don't know what it is, but you, your company sucks and you need to find another ABA company and they can't drop you until they actually do a transition plan. So, and if you can't find another company, make sure your health plan finds you that other company and does that. Not a warm, I mean, more than a warm handoff, okay? They got to do a hot handoff. <laughs> well, Fanny, so. you just find a hot handoff at times where you get the old agency and the new agency with the kid. Working together. Yeah. Um, and, um, and, you know, so the, the old, the former person is orienting the new person. Absolutely. Heard, yeah. So that, you know, it's all very clear. Yeah. So that's my opinion and that's what I think you should do. So I don't know who you are and you know, I'm a big proponent yeah. of ABA. I know it's not for everybody, but whoever that ABA agency, if you know who, you're, who you are, you suck. <laughs> Uh-oh, Jill, we can't hear you. Oh, sorry. Okay. We only have about 15 or 20 more minutes, so um, I'm going to squeeze in as many questions as I can. Some of these are a little bit repetitive, things you've addressed before, but um, I'll go for it anyway. My son will be 21 in October. He has Kaiser Medi-Cal. What options do we have to continue for his ABA? Any laws to continue ABA past 21 for those on Medi-Cal? I know we've addressed this, but go ahead. Oh, and you know what? I think that you guys have to get really active about this. Um, I think that um, I went up to Sacramento with Family Voices on Monday and Tuesday. And, um, you know, there's some activity um, with mental health. Uh, there's still, there's an autism uh, bill in, in the works, and it's about um, not denying ABA in school. And, and I think that you guys need to find um, a new champion and um, go up to Sacramento and take this on. I mean, we have a new governor. I think he's more committed to um, uh, disability issues than Jerry Brown was. 
And I think that um, I'm going to put it out there. I think all the people that have addressed this issue, I know it's a hot issue. And I think we are a trendsetter. No one's doing this. None of the states are doing it. But, you know, a lot of our leaders in Sacramento um, regard us as a, um, a leader a van uh, in the vanguard for, for these things. And I think that um, I think we need to get a new group together of parents and champion this issue find a champion in sacramento that can spearhead it and go from there i don't know if there are some identified um parents that are current legislators people know of them they may be the appropriate people to approach i don't know but i'm just putting it out there i think we need to take this on okay. and i'm not saying i'm going to be the leader of it either i think some of the people that are asking these questions need to be the leaders very good. Um, what is the current state of insurance, the COS, I'm not sure what that means, letting ABA therapists going into schools and schools letting them in? There's oh, insurance, a, pros, insurance companies letting okay. ABA therapists going go into schools. Well, there's a law, there's a bill called SB 399, and it's by the senator assembly member portentino or he could be a um he could be a uh senator i, I don't recall in sacramento um california uh, uh legislator who is championing sb 399 and one of the things that they mention is that children can't be denied um aba because of um that it, it can't be denied if they request it in the school that's one of the, my understanding is that's one of the things in that bill. Now, whether that gives them a legal right to go into the school, um, probably public schools, it probably does, but I'm not 100% sure on this. And I think you'd do better to ask like a special ed attorney or um, COPA, C-O-P-A-A, -A, that is a special a, a association of special ed attorneys. Um, they might have more knowledge on this than I do. Um, there has been, a, there was a case that challenged this. Yeah, they, it challenged this. Um, and I believe that they won. And so it might be able to be used in legal arguments. And now I need to think of the name of that case. Um, Tehachapi, Tehachapi, it was against Tehachapi, which is a, um, and now I need to think of the, the name of the family and I, and they, I worked with them as well. And so I, I should know it, but I, I, I'm not remembering it. Um, I'm sorry. I'll think it might come to me later. So the premise is for why that an ABA agency should go to school with the, um, the student is because they can't access that their natural environment and when you're a child your natural environment is school so while it might not be educationally appropriate it's medically necessary so that is the argument and so before the school could would say that we don't have to let them on campus and that was kind of the thing so what they're saying is it's and but the agency the insurance company is saying, well, we're not going to allow it in school because that's educational. And we do medical, we don't do educational. So that was the kind of the whole thing. But private right. schools allow it all the time. They have no problem. <laughs> hmm, interesting. Here's another question. What range of monthly expense have you seen for parent purchased private insurance for an adult? Oh. Um, well, if it depends on the age of the adult, uh, if that's what you're talking about, because it goes up as you get older. Um, so uh, it should be available on the Covered California uh, website. That that is the and there's many different choices. You might want to consult with a uh, an agent, uh, an insurance, a licensed insurance broker. Um, if you're, if you're interested in that or go to covered California and look, there's, it's going to vary by what plan you choose, um, and the age of the young adult. So if they're like 22, it's going to be lower than if they're like 50. Um, so I don't know the range offhand. 
But my recommendation is if they're going to buy a plan, and let's say you're going to buy, for example, a Kaiser plan, and we know that Kaiser accepts Medi-Cal as a secondary insurance. So my recommendation would be to buy the cheaper premium with the higher copay because Medi-Cal will cover the copay. Uh, but not for things like ABA. I mean, if they're over 20, 21. If they're over 21. Right. I thought that was what the question was. Is it adult? No, they didn't say ABA. They just said which plan. Oh, no, I thought it was for an adult. Yeah, yeah. they just said how much. Yeah, I don't know how much. Uh, but it's publicly available if you buy it on the Covered California Exchange. Like, they, it's like. Um, this is actually, uh, I, here's a question that I actually I hear a lot because it relates to dental services. Um, which seems to be a hot topic among our kids. Any thought on an adult with autism on Dentical? There are no providers. I had to go 50 miles for my son to get sedated for cavities, mm -hmm. and the service was horrible. Um, so, Karen, I have to say, I hear a lot from parents who are really suffering in terms of, of finding and getting, you know, uh, subsidized uh, dental care for their autistic children and adults. Um, can you address the question kind of more broadly, going to paint the big picture here? Um, well, there aren't enough providers, and Feta is going to be able to answer this better than I am because she's been through this with her son. My son is like, my son is oh, oh, under, under sensitive to pain. Like, so, um, but, and so he can go to a regular dentist, and I don't, and so I haven't been through any of this. And professionally, I haven't really worked a lot of these cases either. And I have heard that there's a huge shortage and um, and a lot of our kids need to be anesthetized. And so I'm going to pass this to Feta because I, I haven't worked with it too much. I'm sorry. So one provider that accepts Dentical, I know it's not the greatest, but is Western Dental. It's a huge provider. You can find them in almost every city in California. I mean, they're a mammoth provider. Now, for sedation, this is the thing, is Medi-Cal will pay for the sedation. It has to be in a hospital setting. That's the thing. Now, not all doctors are can do it. Like, we know University of the Pacific, will do it. Sometimes the University of the Pacific will do it because they have a special needs um, program there. So they specialize in doing that. And they will do it for adults, not children. Um, also, and I know more about this for children, um, is that, for example, if you have Medi-Cal and also some kind of primary insurance, your primary insurance will cover the sedation wherever Medi-Cal will do the work. But again, it has to, to be in a hospital setting. They won't do it. If you want to do it at your doctor's office, they're not going to pay for it at your doctor's office. Okay, let's be clear. So only in a hospital setting. So that's just the most important thing. So your son has to go literally under GA, not under twilight sedation, you know, that kind of a thing. So it is more invasive, but you can't get it done at your regular pediatric dentist. Thank and you. For more, and for more severe kids, this is what they do because they can't get x-rays. They sedate them first. They put them under anesthesia first. Then they do all the x-rays and everything. Then they come out and say, okay, this is the work we're going to do. <laughs> yeah, and it's hard. Are there any hospitals like maybe UCSF? Um, UCSF you know, does, does it. Um, Children's course. Hospital Open does it, or UCSF Benioff. But I know for sure UCSF, University of the Pacific, and Children's Hospital Oakland, or whatever it is, Benioff. All right. Um, here's a question that's not quite an insurance question, um, but it's related to something we previously discussed. For an adult who's a regional center client, what are the options for ABA? Um, like, i.e., what would the regional centers provide for behavioral services for adults? Not exactly an insurance question. I think it depends on what's going on. And that if your kid, if the young adult is, ha or the adult is having a lot of behavioral issues, they're more inclined to cover services. But it may not be ABA in the same way that um, 
that we know it um, in the child community. So I, I think that um, it, like it may look a little different. Um, and um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think that it's going to depend on the person and what the needs are. What are your thoughts, Veda? I mean, if the regional center could provide anything from one to one to where I've heard from them providing five to one services, it really oh, wow. depends on this. Oh yes, it really. This okay. kid was having issues. So not really all regional centers are the same either, unfortunately. Uh, so they have different service lines. Right. They have different service lines, and believe me, um, when they really have to, they will create a service line if they need to. Okay. But they don't so like to put it back on them and don't take no for an answer and be like, listen, this kid is out of control. He's going to, you know, he's going to need to go in and I can't keep him. I want to keep him in the community. I want to keep him with me. But unless you help me, I can't. Yeah. So put it on them. Make it their responsibility. OK, uh, I think we have time for about two more questions. Um, here's one from email. It's a little tiny bit long. My eight-year-old son is finally receiving ABA after over two and a half years on the wait list. Wow. Oh, no. Yeah. And the provider accepts our current insurance. Good. If my husband changes jobs with new insurance mm -hmm. and the ABA provider does not accept the new insurance, how can we keep the current ABA service? and get coverage from the new insurance at the in-network level. We don't want to be on the wait list all over again. I don't blame her. No. If not, can we get reimbursement from Medi-Cal for the remaining 40% co-insurance? Um, oh, okay, because it's out of network, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So there is something called continuity of care. If you're transitioning to a plan that is state regulated, our state has some pretty good regulations around continuity of care. And so um, uh, you want to, especially if you're in the middle of like a six month cycle of treatment, um, they're highly likely to, um, uh, you might have to go to the DMHC, you may not have to, but you want to point that out that you're in the middle of a cycle of approved care and he needs to keep this, you know, the treatment. And so um, that should be coverable. And then I believe the, the state regs, if you go to dmhc.ca.gov um, and you uh, put in a search for continuity of care, you'll get the information up and autism is a chronic condition. And I believe you can keep it up to a year. And if they don't have a place for him to go, if he's just going to go back on a wait list, then you need to make it really clear to the, um, the, the insurance company that they need to, um, you know, they need to provide something. If they don't have anything, then that's where he's staying. Um, and if you run into trouble and it's a state regulated plan, you need to bring the regulator into the conversation if you're not getting any traction with the insurance company. Feta has something or else. You can, or you can buy him an individual plan. Or use your Medicaid. The second part was, can you use your Medicaid for the, the 40%? Um, you want to get it in, in for out. If they don't have anything current, then you need to get a single case agreement. Um, and then the other thing is that, can you use your Medi-Cal for secondary? Uh, I think that um, if the primary offers, um, if you can't get anything through them, then you need to get them to pay at the in-network rate. So that's the answer. And buying a plan, but there's also Medi-Cal, Theta. So yeah. If they take Medi-Cal, yeah. Right. Uh, oh, the insurance, yes, the um, ABA provider, you're right. Here, here's someone just seeking some clarification. So you can buy a private plan on Covered California, which by the way, someone wrote in and said, it's like $700 a month um, for an adult. Um, uh, if, what age, really? Okay. Uh, someone just, I, I mean, I'm just telling you someone said and she's roughly. Um, buy a private plan on Covered California if the adult child is on Medi-Cal. You can do that, but you won't qualify for a subsidy. 
That's right, because he has a, a an acceptable plan from Medi-Cal. That's correct. Okay. All right. So, um, are for those that don't have a, any option, any other option. Okay. Well, um, we are at our hour. We have a few other questions that came in, but I have to say they're pretty similar to questions that we've already pitched to you. So um, I, I'm reluctant to keep going, but I will say this, you know, we, we certainly heard a lot of interesting um, you know, uh, problems people are having out there. These are things you know, that we know that uh, apply broadly across a lot of our families. And Karen, we would love to have you back another time, maybe to, to you know, go at all the follow-up questions and some other questions. But um, I really want to thank you so much. You are a, a fount of, of wisdom. And, you know, when you are telling people, like, you aren't going to go to Sacramento this time, people have to realize that you are one of the moms who went to Sacramento and went to Sacramento yeah. to really... And so did Faith. Yes. Kristen Jacobson, yes. We were a triumvirate. And there were many others, too, that went up a lot. And it's a lot of work and it's a lot of responsibility and, um, you know, and you have to kind of drop everything and hurry up and get there. And, and, and yeah, so I'm not up for it again, but I'll, I'll, I'll be, I'll be like back up and I'll guide and I'll, I'll do some of it, but I'm not leading it. Right. And so I guess exactly my point is we need more leaders like you yeah. who are willing to step up to the plate and, you know, fight for more reforms that we need, whether it's in the insurance area or other areas like housing. Right. So um, we, I just wanted to thank you, Karen, for your time here and all that you've done in years past. And I even want to thank Feda for um, adding um, her perspective. Feda was very helpful. Thank you. You had my back as always. <laughs> all right, guys, we are signing off and um, you will get the archive by email. It will also be on our website. Thanks, Thank everyone. Bye. Bye, everyone.